of the Lamoille County uh, Chamber of Commerce. And this meeting is not about me, it's about our guests up front. We invite our legislators every month during the session to tell us what they're doing and respond to questions that you might have. So um, I'm going to start it right off. Uh, uh, we'll start at the end with Heidi Shurman, and uh, they will tell a little bit about what they're doing. And do you want to save questions for later? Or? Yeah. All right. Then good. We'll go through. We'll go through the introductions, and then we'll open up to questions. So thanks. Hello. Um, yeah. So I'm. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Heidi Sherman. I represent the town of Stowe, um, and um, uh, in the in the House of Representatives, um, I am on the um, Energy and Technology Committee actually with Mark Higley, who's just walking in right now. So he's gonna join us up here. Um, I serve on the Energy and Technology Committee um, right now, um, and we are, um, right now the focus of the Energy and Technology Committee is the Global Warming Solutions Act. It's a new version of, of the uh, bill that was introduced last year. Um, so we are, that's the focus right now. It is a priority of our chair, uh, and we're going through that. I'm happy to answer questions about that. Uh, my other focus and my main focus throughout the summer and fall was uh, was tourism um, to ensure we uh, invest more. We've been we've been uh, um, losing we've been decreasing our uh, our investment in tourism marketing. So I wanted to make sure we started to invest more because uh, we've lost market share as a result, in my view. And so uh, we're focused on that. Um, and for for good news was. Um, and in general, and I'm sure people will talk about it, there were some really good things in, for Lamoille County in the, um, and rural economic development in the, in the proposed budget. But the governor specifically pr uh, pr uh, proposed a million dollar additional investment into marketing, um, and it's a whole package um, of marketing, and, 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 it's, um, and it's, our goal now is to keep it in, is to fight uh, and do all we can to keep it in the House version of the budget, and then keep it in the Senate version of the budget. So that's it for me. Good morning, I'm Dave Iacoboni, uh, Morristown, Elmore, Worcester, and Woodbury. Can you all hear me okay? Great. Yes. I'm on the Appropriations Committee. We deal with a variety of different things. Um, I focus on housing, uh, healthcare uh, via Medicaid, Green Mountain Care Board, et cetera, a number of other different parts of the budget. One area that I'm going to be um, focusing on, particularly this week and, and in the next several weeks, is the uh, workforce shortage in healthcare. We have a shortage of 3,900 nurses, RNs, LPNs, nurse aides, uh, et cetera. It's a critical problem. And uh, the, the governor, uh, very pleased, he put a million dollars in the budget to try to address it. We'll hear his presentation today. Basically, the way it's been framed is um, uh, a reduction in state income taxes for those in the nursing field. My, my proposal was to put it towards tuition relief with the understanding you a person would stay in Vermont for um, a number of years. It's all a question in my mind, what's a therapeutic dose? What will help with that? We also have a real problem with our primary care doctors. There's roughly 300 doctors, um, slightly more than 300 doctors, um, uh, residents at the UVM Medical Center who want to become physicians, only 19 of them have declared that they want to be family practitioners. The primary care is a problem. We have to address it. So I'll be, I'll be focusing on that uh, in earnest in the next couple of weeks, among many other things. Thanks. Good morning. I'm Dan Noyes. Um, represent Wolcott, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Belvedere with Matt Hill, who has the flu. And so we're lucky he's not here giving it to all of us. So. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm on the Human Services Committee. We're taking up a couple bills this session um, that I've introduced. One of them is the Older Vermonters Act, and it's a bill I've worked on with Teresa Wood for over a year to basically look at how Vermont pro provides services to older Vermonters. Um, it looks at how agencies work together, how um, nonprofits um, can be able to deliver services for um, making sure supports and protections are, are available to, to older Vermonters. So um, we started testimony on that bill last week. We're gonna take it up again next week. 
Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing that move. It's H611 if anyone's following along. Um, and then I also have been working on a bill around the Office of the Child Advocate. So this is um, looking at how um, children in foster care uh, have, um, how they're uh, supported uh, in DCF. So um, we'll be taking that up tomorrow morning at, um, or tomorrow afternoon after the floor. So one o'clock we'll be, we'll start on the Office of the Child Advocate, so. So I'm Rich Westman, and um, I technically represent um, all the towns in the county except for um, Wilcott, but Wilcott calls me just the same um, um, as uh, <laughs> the Lamoille County Senator, and I think they rarely call their um, real senators um, or the people they get to vote for in Orleans County, um, um, the two senators up there. Um, the thing I'm most excited about is um, I've worked a, a long time through years on transportation, um, from House transportation through Senate transportation, um, to move ahead the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. And I was thrilled that the governor put $11 million into um, the budget, and, and that's state and federal match to uh, finish the rail trail from St. Johnsbury to Swanton. I think um, that will be a boom to um, the county and um, all across the northern part of the state. Um, the 93 miles will be the longest trail in New England. And um, um, it's been a long time coming, you know. Um, I was chair of transportation when um, we decided to make the jump to go from uh, a railroad to a trail. Um, I um, worked in um, Senate transportation to create a match between uh, and start to bring um, um, state and federal dollars to um, fix the trail. So the idea of um, the state taking over and com um, working to complete the trail, I think is big for all of us. Um, in the Senate, we do two, we're on two committees, unlike the um, House, which is one committee. My morning committee is health and welfare. Um, and we're um, focusing on um, um, a bill that would eliminate um, flavors for vaping. And um, um, I expect sometime in a couple of weeks that will probably come out of our committee um, in that. We're also working on a bill that um, would, as they created our family centers across the state, they did it over three different periods of time, and the statutes that created the family centers are kind of disjointed. And um, um, I'm the lead sponsor on a bill that would help more formalize what um, their roles are, how the money gets distributed between each of the family centers, and um, takes a better look at what they all do, and we're working on that. Um, my afternoon committee's appropriations, we're um, waiting for the budget adjustment, which um, the House is, um, I think, just completed? Yeah, we just passed mm -hmm. it. They just passed it. It will come to us, and we'll probably turn it around this um, week. Um, I would just say the uh, one of the other areas that we're working on is um, the shortage in primary care nurses, and I would say Dave's estimate of 3,900 shortage in nurses. That's 3,900 nurses that will be leaving the profession over the next five years. But more importantly to that, we have 5,500 nurses in this state that are traveling nurses. So if you're um, the manor, you're Copley, um, or you're the home health agencies, all across the state. Um, those are the most expensive nurses that you can get. And we all would much rather have people that are in there. The real problem is out of about 25,000 licensed nurses in the next five years, we have to um, find placements, uh, or we'd like to find placements for nearly 9,000. And we only graduate 240 nurses, or 260 nurses a year. And, and primary care docs, we're short 
70 primary care docs. And if you figure it, 1,500 patients per doctor, that means that we have a shortage of primary care docs. One in six Vermonters does not have a primary care doc. So we are at a crisis stage as, as it comes to primary care. And when you talk about one care that's supposed to be reorganizing the money to go back into primary care, um, you can't do it without people to do the work. Well, good morning and thank you. I'm uh, Representative Mark Hickey from Lowell. So I represent Lowell, J. Westfield, Troy, and Eden. Uh, as Heidi said, I also sit on uh, energy and technology as well as Avram here. So we're, we're pretty well represented up here on, on that committee. Um, I heard Heidi mention the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, that's pretty much what we've taken testimony on. It's a big concern for me. Um, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about it. Um, interesting study committee that I sat in on this summer was uh, Forest Carbon Sequestration Working Group. Uh, that's quite a mouthful, but uh, uh, you might have heard about a burnt mountain project that the Nature Conservancy was uh, involved in up in my area. 5,400 acres they were looking at uh, putting that uh, land in the California compliance market uh, where they actually pay uh, a certain amount for uh, the acreage to, to sequester uh, carbon. A lot has happened since then. They, they actually uh, don't qualify now under that compliance market with California, so they're looking at what they call a voluntary market. Uh, pretty involved. Um, it's, uh, it's not as simple as uh, I wish it was that 78% uh, of Vermont is forested and the forest owners, uh, uh, it would be nice if they could reap the benefits from uh, the carbon that they sequestered. But it's, uh, these, these programs are definitely uh, uh, difficult to uh, get involved in. They usually require large uh, acreage of land. Um, it's expensive and uh, it, ties, it ties it up for quite, quite, a, quite a long time. The California compliance market is 100 years. Other uh, voluntary markets are around 40 years, so it's quite a commitment. Um, just briefly again, two other things. Uh, we, we took some testimony uh, quickly about cybersecurity uh, in the state as well as municipalities. They're trying to do a, a big effort to make sure that uh, uh, towns and cities and the, and the state government are responsible around um, the amount of uh, cyber attacks on our systems daily is just unbelievable, and it's so important. Uh, you might have heard about some of these cities out there that uh, folks have been uh, uh, broken into and had all their information stolen, and it cost them millions and millions of dollars to get it back. Um, and if they don't get it back in that way, paying the ransom, uh, it costs millions and millions of dollars to uh, uh, regenerate all that information. And then uh, one other uh, quick thing that came in was uh, a study on artificial intelligence. That's everything from the new uh, farm milking systems that uh, are pretty all robotic to supposedly in 20 years possibly having a chip put in your head where you can correspond with people rather than you know through a cell phone or iPad or whatever. Uh, I guess there was some concern around that, um, looking at uh, a possible um, uh, ethics commission. Uh, but. Uh, Anyway, the, the main focus is on the Global Warming Solutions Act. Good morning. I'm Avram Pat. I'm a representative from the same district that Dave is representing, uh, the, the, which is uh, Morristown, Elmore, Woodbury, and Worcester. Uh, as Mark said, I'm also a member of the uh, House uh, Energy and Technology Committee. Uh, the three of us uh, spend a lot of time crammed into a very tiny little room, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's nice to be in a larger room together. Um, I've spent uh, most of my career uh, in one way or the other working on energy issues uh, as, uh, as general manager of Washington Electric Co-op for many years and before that in state government. So. Uh, uh, Climate change is, is a major issue. It's been uh, something I've been growing more aware of uh, starting, I, I guess, in the, in the 1990s. Um, the G Global Warming Solutions Act, which I think will come out of our committee uh, relatively soon. I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, there, are, there are a number of pieces to it. Um, what that does is take uh, Vermont's 
goals around uh, carbon reduction and renewable energy, uh, which the legislature established uh, quite a number of years ago and which we're not meeting, uh, and says that this is a requirement and that uh, the state government needs to uh, promulgate rules and actually have a plan uh, that, that accomplishes that. Uh, we've heard testimony, uh, uh, Mark touched on, on some of those things, but also I want, want to talk about the awareness in our communities, in the, in the towns and the regional planning commissions uh, about this issue and about the fact that it is happening um, and that uh, towns and, and regions are, are actively involved in mitigation and preparing uh, for flooding and other uh, uh, disaster kind of situations, not just uh, repairing after the fact, uh, but doing things uh, to change uh, bridges and streams so that uh, there's less likelihood of flooding or that the flooding is not as severe as we've seen, including in Lamoille County. Uh, we had a video uh, from the uh, uh, Lamoille Regional Commission uh, about work that's that's been happening in some towns. Uh, so I think this, what I'm also, I would just say, I'm also uh, impressed that uh, in almost every committee, at least in the House, uh, each committee owns some piece of this issue uh, and is working on it. Certainly uh, the Transportation Committee is um, and natural resources is, um, agriculture is, uh, they, everybody uh, has a part to play in, in bills large and small uh, uh, to help us deal with this issue um, and, and try to get ahead of it in terms of the impact it has on Vermont. Good morning, I'm Lucy Rogers. I represent uh, Cambridge and Waterville in the Vermont House and I serve on the House Health Care Committee. Um, our committee, I feel like we've really hit the ground running with a number of quite different topics that all have come up as being relevant all at once. Um, we're working along with our counterparts in the Senate on evaluating the Accountable Care Organization One Care and the funding flow for our health care system. We've taken some testimony on the issue with the Brattleboro retreat, although much of that is left to negotiations between the administration and the retreat. So we've been kind of following what's going on without really acting at this point. Um, and then my own priority right now in the healthcare committee is I'm working on a bill I introduced surrounding healthcare price transparency. So I'll be presenting to my committee on Thursday some of the work I've done um, researching what all of the other states have and have not done surrounding trying to make healthcare prices uh, more available to patients, preferably prior to um, going in for a procedure and hoping that we can replicate um, some of the good work that's happened in other states. Um, another project I've been working on along with a colleague, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> um, Another, another um, project I've been working on along with a Republican colleague in Dan Noyes' committee is efforts to increase access to contraception. Um, and so there's, there's a number of different ways to approach this issue, but one huge measure that Vermont could take um, would be to enable, oftentimes when people are prescribed hormonal contraception, they're prescribed a year at a time, but insurance will allow you to pick up only one to three months at a time, and particularly in a rural area, if you work during the times when the pharmacy is open and it's 20 miles from your house to begin with, it's it, it makes a pretty big difference as far as people's ability to um, be consistent in using contraception, hormonal contraception, which only works with consistency. So there was a study done in California of 65,000 women, and they found that the women who were able to receive, of oh, 65,000 women who used hormonal contraception and the women who could receive a year's supply at a time had a 30% reduction in unwanted pregnancies relative to the women who could only receive one or three months at a time. So it's a pretty small 
measure um, that makes a pretty big difference. And then the final piece I've been working on, um, I'm again a member of the Rural Economic Development Working Group, which is a nonpartisan caucus that deals with issues of rural economies. Um, I just received the highly prestigious title of assistant clerk of the Rural Economic Development <laughs> Caucus. So I've been, um, been working with that group and we've really prioritized following the um, developments in Act 250 as the priority to this group. Um, it's not in my committee, but it's an issue that I think is pretty important to this community and, and to me personally to be following, um, even though it's in a different committee. Uh, I'd like to make two comments before we move over to the questions and answers. Um, one comment is, um, it's amazing the, the uh, turnout today, and I'm really excited about it, so I appreciate everybody showing up. Um, and if you politely ask Josh to host it again, there he is, <laughs> maybe we can do this again on a regular basis, because this has worked very well. The second thing is, we have all of our legislators right here, with the exception of the one who saved us from getting sick. So uh, we owe a, a, a lot of gratitude. And personally, I've, there is a topic about which I've become fairly passionate lately. So I've actually attended some committee meetings in the State House, and I've seen almost every one of these working, one of these legislators working uh, really hard. So uh, you can go to the State House, you can go to committee meetings, you can see our legislators working, and it's pretty impressive. So let's have a little thanks for our. Uh, legislators this morning. Okay, now it's open to questions and answers. Yes. Can we just stand up and? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I'm Amy Olson. I'm the director of the Lantern Memorial Library in Bay Park and president of the Vermont Library Association. And I just want to bring to your attention that right now in the Senate Committee on Education, there is a draft bill about creating a working group to explore uh, the state of libraries in Vermont, academic, school, and public libraries. Um, who knows as a draft if it will move out of committee and go anywhere, but I have read the uh, the draft carefully several times, and I feel like it's a very good bill. It'll be very interesting and exciting for libraries in Vermont. And just one portion of the bill that I feel very strongly about is um, the last part, which if this bill passes by law, there will be certain people named to this committee. And with the exception of two, uh, everyone would have to leave their regular jobs and put a lot of their own time into it. So the compensation portion of that's really important, especially because a lot of times librarians do things out of the kindness of their heart for the love of their communities and this is something that's on a much bigger scale and it's pretty exciting and also just want to shout out cindy weber from the stokery library the director is here she is the immediate past president of the vermont library association and currently on the vermont library association's government relations committee and we're hoping to get a vermont library state day so hopefully that will happen sometime this year as well so I look forward to getting your support if that bill moves out of uh, committee and so the Can you email me and give me a little critique of the bill and uh, Do you want it. a copy of it, Rich? No, you can get it to me. <laughs> email, it, email it to me and okay. get I back can to do that. Me. Sure thing. Okay. Uh, yes, and before you do that, I want you to know that uh, some of our legislators have to leave by around 9 o'clock. So we're, little, we're going to be tight on time, so let's keep it. Go ahead. I'm Bruce Shields, and uh, one of the questions that always comes up when the legislature is in session in recent years, in what way do you intend to torture ordinary citizens? And I'm thinking of removing plastic bags, mandatory composting, and various uh, behavioral things that you seem to spend a lot of time on. But I want to bring to your attention the amendments to Act 250. And I'm not sure that it has a bill number yet. Uh, <clears throat> the, there was a commission created a couple of years ago, which very dutifully went around Vermont and held a whole series of hearings. Approximately 400 people participated in those hearings, uh, including many owners of small businesses. And Act 250 has 
not been friendly to small businesses located in the rural landscape. Uh, it has been very costly. Uh, people have had to spend up to $100,000 complying with the mandates. Uh, for a small sawmill or other business of that kind, $100,000 is real money. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm not going to advocate for any individual point in, in the forthcoming bill. But I do want to say this. The, the commission generated about 400 pages of testimony and analysis of the testimony. And probably, given how busy you are, you're not going to have the, the chance to look at the Coke Associates analysis of that testimony. But I, I wish you would, because one of the appendices there analyzes how the attendees of those sessions felt on a number of specific questions. One of the questions was, has Act 250 been helpful to economic activity in your area? 14 <coughs> counties found that it was negative. Only one county in Vermont thought that Act 250 helped to their economic activity. And it's the most populous county. You, I don't need to name it. Uh, so in 87% of Vermont, Act 250 has been uh, a, a, uh, a deleterious <laughs> effect on economic activity. Only one act, one county, consistently thinks it's been good. So bear that in mind when you when you read all of those provisions in Act 250. Can I can I respond? Yeah. So thank you, Bruce. So two things, Bruce, um, and I, I hear you uh, with all of that. I will say that I think in many ways um, uh, Act 250, as it began and when it started and why it started um, and why it came to fruition is important. It was a way to uh, ensure uh, that we did have some planning and, uh, and what have you throughout the state. I think the way it's been implemented recently in late uh, of late is, is challenging and so problematic for uh, many of our rural counties. I will say this, the commission um, had, had some different ideas than what is really on the table right now, or at least part of it. On the table right now is an agreement between the administration and VNRC um, that they are discussing in the um, House Natural Resources Committee. That agreement includes a number of things. One of them is that um, Act 250 would be, um, you, uh, would be eliminated altogether in uh, downtowns, in uh, smart growth areas, in village centers, um, to try to encourage those communities, uh, other communities, to, to, get, uh, to get those designations and to eliminate the uh, district commissions as a result. Uh, and then the big, those bigger projects would go to a state. Um, the other thing that I hear that they, they're doing, which is important to me, is the milling issue. The mills, uh, from what I understand, this commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation has been in natural resources, has been advocating for some... Um, or at least explaining the need for um, uh, for Act 250 changes with regard to sawmills. Um, and I think this goes hand in hand with climate change in general. What you're seeing every day are hundreds of trucks, big, heavy diesel trucks going up to Canada to, um, to, to do milling and then come, coming back here. If we can have some milling capacity back um, in Vermont, in rural Vermont, it will help rural communities. So I know that those are those are three things that are going on right now, but I'm sure you'll keep posted. But if you have any questions, I'll, I'm I'm keeping posted on it as well. But yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Right. My name is Kathy Cookson. I am the director of Clubhouse Kids and Morristown After School Program. And we are filled with a room of child care champions. Dave Macaboni, you're the Lamoille County champion and Senator Westman received an award for Let's Grow Kids for his work in the 2019 session. I received a phone call on Friday and I thought it was the strangest phone call. 
somebody was calling from Waterbury, and they said, I live in Waterbury, I work in Waterbury, I really need child care. I will come all the way to Morrisville to drop my infant off if you have room, and then I will go back to Waterbury, and I will come back. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a long commitment. What's the problem? So I started doing some research. Right now, I just read a study that there's 2,100 shortages of lead teachers. So lead teachers have to have 21 college credits at minimum and a year of working experience. And there's 2,100 open positions right now. We, two weeks ago, got granted increased capacity and the very next day, one of our lead teachers gave her notice. So we scrambled to figure out how are we gonna solve this. So this year, you have the teach, teach um, funding is coming before you, and it helps to have people who want to be in childcare afford to go to classes to become qualified. Um, there's also something coming above uh, to you with student loan assistance repayment. Childcare is such a low paying field that seeing people who just really want to be in childcare go into debt, it's heartbreaking, but it's also needed. Um, the regulations are being looked at and revised and a point was made to me over the weekend is, yeah, they're not revising um, what a lead teacher needs because it wasn't, the shortage wasn't known at the time that the committee met. So I did a little more research and I found New York has a commitment clause that says, if, you're if you've been in the field and you are enrolled to become a lead teacher, you're going to those classes, that you can work as a lead teacher. If you stop working and stop going to um, college to become that lead, then you no longer qualify. I would love to see that clause put in here because there are people, I have so many people at my center enrolled to become a lead teacher, people who are one class away, who can't be alone with children as their lead, and it's, it's just draining on systems. Like, we're so close to having this high quality and these little barriers. Um, lastly, you're gonna see a program called Wages come up, and it is going to help make compensation more equitable. It's, it's going to support people in early childhood so that we have people stay in early childhood and not get their degree and go to public school, which is happening right now. So thank you for your support and thanks for your continued funding. <laughs> thank you. So, so um, I'm speaking. I, oh, I, I think oh, um, um, I, I, I think both Dave and I probably have something we'd like to say. Mine is pretty simple. Thank you for what you do. Could you send us an email with um, the provisions you would like implemented? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that would be important. I would say to you, there, um, in the governor's speech, he did say there was three and a half million to increase um, funding um, in the child care area. Um, and over the last um, four to five years, um, we have increased the funding by a third, so we're we're nicking away at this, but we still, to highlight what you've got, we only have placements in regulated care for 48% of all the kids. And if you look at our society now, 70% um, of all kids, both their parents work. So that leaves a gap of almost one in every four kids. Um, they're in some sort of care someplace that we have no idea where they are, what's going on. Um, I'll just say that there's um, there's some changes in the education committee right now, a bill around uh, child care that uh, we're following in the human services committee and it may come to our committee. So, yeah, include me on that as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Phil Coleman. I'm, I'm speaking here as a member of the Vermont Workers Center and not in um, association with any other um, organizations, including this one, Green Mountain Support Services, that I also I'm affiliated with, but um, my questions have to do with um, One Care Vermont and um, specifically um, the funding for One Care Vermont um, seems as though it's supporting uh, another, according to the policy people I've, that we've been speaking with in the 
Vermont Worker Center anyway, it seems as though it's supporting an additional layer of administration um, rather than supporting um, direct services um, at the same time as um, the legislature for years and years now has been unable to um, fund Act 48, which was to have provided um, health care services for um, everyone in the state. I mean, granted, there's been a lot of progress made over the years with Green Mountain Care, um, opening up access to increasing numbers of people, but we are really um, asking that um, the legislature take a close look at the need for, um, for One Care Vermont, um, the rationale for it, and um, we're also asking the legislature to um, take a very close look at, uh, <clears throat> at the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, when the Green Mountain Care Board annually hears um, rate hike requests from um, Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP Vermont, we've been um, down there, um, I was down there last year, and the majority of the people who uh, testified were members of um, Vermont Workers Center. Um, the the uh, Green Mountain Care Board heard um, testimony from people who were really adversely um, impacted by um, the healthcare situation from all sorts of different perspectives. And um, we're asking that um, Green Mountain Care Board be really um, held accountable for what appears to be a very close correlation with the insurance industry and um, a lack of responsiveness to the needs of um, low income uh, and people with low income Vermonters and people with um, specific uh, health uh, situations that are really running amok in terms of um, costs that are ruinous and resulting in bankruptcy <coughs> and um, inability to afford the care that they need and, or maintain their housing or other basic essentials. Can I speak to that? Yeah, thank you so much. I. Um... I think you have a lot of good points and I share a lot of your concerns. And just to kind of add to what you were saying with One Care, the Accountable Care Organization, when you look at studies across the entire healthcare system in the United States, there's definitely many, many, many different areas of monetary waste and inefficiency, which is which all contribute to the overall cost of healthcare being more expensive than any other country. But the biggest category of waste is admi is administrative waste, and it's the category that's been studied the least and has the least policy efforts to address it. And so I think I think you're absolutely right on to say that, you know, we it's kind of maybe adding waste in the administrative burden to try to address waste in other areas, which is not necessarily something that will bring us to greater efficiency in our system. I think there are definitely aspects of their efforts that are really good. And I think it's it's all of our job um, to be weighing those two sides. But I hear you and I, I, I share a lot of those concerns. So thank you. Um, I'm, I'm just going to add, I have, I've, I've always had number one huge concerns about the Green Mountain Care Board and about um, the establishment of it. Its mission originally, as we all know, was to move as we moved into single payer, and that mission is now changed. They haven't changed their mission, but um, but or officially, but they're doing all sorts of other things. And I have huge concerns about five unelected people making um, the, the decisions that they're making. I also have real concerns about One Care. I think that that is. I think they have had time to show uh, results, and I don't think they have shown results in my view. Um, I think they should be given. Um, a, a time limit that says these these results have to be met by a certain date, and if not, we're not going to renew your um, your your uh, certification as the ACO. Um, and in general, I'm not sure if the ACO model is is the model we should be. I have real concerns about where we're at now. Um, as somebody who, well, I just have real concerns about where we're at right now um, with regard to the ACO, uh, One Care, and uh, the Green Mountain Care Board. And healthcare reform in general. My uh, area of jurisdiction on appropriations is this area, so I've been spending a lot of time uh, looking at this. I'm reminding, I'm reminded of the old saying: No matter how thin the pancake, there's always two sides uh, to, to every issue. Um, uh, the One Care or the Accountable Care Organization is part of a five-year waiver demonstration project. We're, I think we're in year three right now. 
there, there are pros and cons, and in my mind, the jury's still out. However, I try to frame it this way. Um, how do you think the New England Patriots would do if they had no coach? There was no Bill Belichick. How do you think um, a school would do if there were no principal? Things might get a little chaotic. Well, the point is in healthcare, there's many, some 5,000 different uh, providers in our system who register for Medicaid and Medicare and from occupational therapists to mental health therapists to surgeons, et cetera, 5,000 of them, and none are really coordinated. The accountable care organization, the intent, whether we can achieve it or not, it's an open question, is to bring some cohesion and coordination to a system that is essentially leaderless. It has payers like Blue Cross and MVP and Medicaid and Medicare, which uh, oversee and regulate them, which often create individual initiatives. We know that most of healthcare is driven by chronic care. Each of those payers I mentioned has a different chronic care system that we're trying to coordinate. The hope is that there will be savings in the short term you do have to have some admin administrative costs. I've been asking when when will we start to see administrative reductions for the insurance companies and for Medicaid as as we transition our health care to one care, roughly 1.3 billion or 1.4 billion this year, as more and more Vermonters are transferred to that system. So it is complex. I'm driven by what you said. I mean, ultimately, it's about getting care to people and reducing the administrative cost. But there's a, there's more than two sides to this. But thank you for your question. I'm sorry. Can I just add one thing? Because Dave reminds me. What my concern is, um, um, over overarching concern, is um, is uh, the rural Vermont. Um, I fear, um, as we look to administrative savings, we did the same thing for education, administrative savings. Um, we, I, I fear that healthcare is going the same route as education, which is bigger is better, consolidation is better, um, one size fits all. Um, and, um, and that's ultimately my concern, is the loss of, 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 of the care needed and um, provided in, in the rural areas of the state and the, and uh, the, the behemoth of UVM Medical Center um, and its affiliates. I, I, I fear that. What, just one more. <laughs> when Heidi was speaking, it reminded me of our state motto and the tension, freedom and unity. I'm trying to strike that balance. How do we have the um, creative, the, how do we have a system that's creative and responses to the little areas as well as the big areas? And how is it unified so that we can afford it? It's hard. So then, I'll just add, on Thursday in the Human Services Committee, we had a pretty extensive <laughs> overview of what's going on at One Care. They put a, it's on our page, they like did a PowerPoint, and we'll be looking at some of the prevention uh, work that they're, they're, they're doing. So I would um, say to you, um, the Senate Health and Welfare Committee has a bill that bill was um, the lead sponsors, um, Senator Lyons, the chair of our committee. Um, the bill also has the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, um, Senator Cummings, um, the chair of appropriations, um, Senator Kitchell, and myself. And it really is a review of how all of these pieces come together. And, and, and there's a, a great deal of concern amongst us. What there is unity about, though, is that we need to move money out of the high-end procedures that are performed in, um, in specialty practices into primary care. And um, the question is, is what the regulatory piece, if they're really, if the regulatory system that the uh, Green Mountain Care Board represents really has the tools to be able to do it for something that was designed to move into single payer. And the question for one care is, um, what are their results and are they picking the right things to spend money on? 
Um, I personally will tell you that as I look at it, we can move all the money, or try to move all the money we want into primary care, primary care doctors and um, nursing um, practitioners and, and those practices. But if we don't have people doing that work, which we have tremendous shortages of, of people in that area, we're never going to be able to accomplish that. So there's a lot of um, um, there's a lot of interest in the legislature, and we're all beginning to push to look in that area to make sure. But at its base, I don't think we can lose sight of the fact we need to move money out of the high end procedures and into getting primary care. And how we how we get there is um, is difficult. Good morning and thank you. Um, I'm Jessica Vickford from Healthy Lamoille Valley. Um, we started getting back the 2019 Youth Risk Behavior Survey data. And one area, um, we have it for the state level, one area of um, concerning increase is that for last 30 day use of marijuana, it's gone from 24% to 27%. And I know that we're you know, potentially moving towards legalized markets. So I just encourage you as that process is happening to kind of keep on your forefront. What are the things that we can do as, as it's being enacted to support prevention? Um, Vermont does not have substance prevention um, in the budget as a, um, an area of funding, but there are things we can do, you know, so, uh, restricting outlet density. You know, we've seen in some of the states that have legalized that Marijuana outlets are popping up everywhere. It's changing the look and feel of the town. So looking at that, looking at signage restrictions, you know, um, is it a single small sign or are they big graphic signs? These are things that matter to our youth and increase their exposure. So, so as this conversation is happening, what are the things that you can build in um, to protect our youth? I just say, um, you know, um, where we are now, I think, is exactly the wrong place to be. We've legalized, and we haven't um, set up a regulated market to make sure that the safeguards that you mentioned might be in. And um, you know, as somebody that sat there for the last six years and have voted five times on the record to um, have a legal, regulated market, and I think the regulated piece is the most important piece of this, we, um, we just legalized it, and we let um, the black market rule the day the way um, um, it is, and I think that's wrong. And I have a little difference of opinion on that. Um, I, I don't believe that the regulated market will help. Uh, I was on government operations committee years ago when we were initially talking about this, talking to the state of Washington, uh, where they wanted to make sure that there was... Uh, an opt-in policy, not an opt-out policy. And as you've seen already throughout the state, there's a lot of towns already that are jumping on board to, to, to opt out. Um, so uh, that, that's a concern to me. I think it, it should be an opt-in because it's expensive and so on to, to opt out. Um, I've continued to listen to uh, uh, folks from Colorado. Uh, there was a uh, emergency room nurse in Colorado who um, had done some of her own surveying as well as uh, state statistics and so on about the uh, number of emergency rooms uh, uh, visits, uh, especially from young people and so on. And it's amazing to me, uh, it, it boggles the mind as to what they're putting and infusing uh, THC in. A uh, huge concern for me. I don't believe that looking at even Colorado, that uh, tax and regulating it is, is gonna solve the problem. The other thing that I see, to be honest with you, is I believe that some of this hemp production around the state is also just a initial starting point for folks that want to jump into the uh, production of, uh, of marijuana as well. Um, I've, I've seen some uh, farmland in, in my town um, go into it from outfits out of New Jersey, and I guess there's uh, you know, from all over the country uh, jumping on it here in Vermont. Uh, so I'm just wondering what some of those uh, uh, you know, final intentions are. We should touch base afterwards um, because my committee will be commenting on the health care parts of the bill tomorrow. So if you want to chat afterwards, we should do it. Yeah. 
Uh, Greg Stransky from Johnson. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for your service, especially looking out for our, our whole state. And my question has to do with just your perspective on our local community, the county, the valley, um, however you want to define uh, local uh, community. Um, right now, in my uh, role over at Capstone Community Action, I'm working with Tasha Wallace from the Memorial County Planning Commission. And uh, we've been working on a grant application uh, to the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston uh, to get some funding, um, initially a planning grant, maybe 10,000, but uh, uh, with hopes of applying for an implementation grant of up to $300,000 with pretty wide parameters. Uh, the goal and purpose of the grant is to um, strengthen the economy and provide for healthy communities. So we've been reaching out to a uh, diversity of uh, partners, about 80 or so individuals so far, uh, in our uh, community in terms of where uh, might we get the most benefit if we were to receive these resources. So I'm curious to hear from each of you with all the input that you receive, the connections that you have in our local community, data and reports and information that you see, if you could name one or two priority issues for our community, um, what would those be? And it would be wonderful to hear from all of you if, if uh, you are willing. Thank you. Um, just, I'll just do it real quickly. I think, um, you know, born and raised here in Lamoille County, it's a, it's, it's an incredible place um, in so many ways. But, um, but where we're failing is um, the economy. We are, um, we, I mean, look around the room. I don't know how many private businesses, private investment folks are here. I'd be curious. Um, we have a lot of nonprofits. We have a lot of healthcare agencies. We've got a lot of education. We got all this stuff, but private investment, the stuff that actually pays for those things to happen and to take care of those most vulnerable in the state, um, isn't happening enough in Lamoille County, and that's where we're failing. We don't have um, we don't have enough private investment, and we need to. We must encourage and incent uh, people to invest uh, private dollars. Um, and private capital uh, into business so that uh, we can have jobs, good paying jobs, so that we can help pay for things that we're talking about uh, all over that everybody wants to see. And so people can frankly pros prosper, raise their families, live, work, play here uh, in a way that they'd like to, so. You said two things. Um, I agree with what Heidi said. I also would add healthcare uh, broadly. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the gap between the haves and the have-nots is widening. I'm, I'm not in my committee when economic development proposals come in. I am, am not a champion of giving money to people from out of state to come here. I was the only person on our committee to vote against that. I'd spend the money, but I'd invest it in people who are already here to help them. And it's a combination of different strategies um, that we could get into to help do that. I do believe that tourism uh, and promoting it will have benefits for our state, uh, perhaps more quickly than anything else we would do. Healthcare, um, I don't think people uh, will be able to stay or want to come if we don't have a workforce. So uh, one in four Vermonters are gonna be over the age of 65 by 2030 and uh, one thing I've been working on around is planning for what's that going to look like? How are Meals on Wheels programs and senior centers going to be successful? And how are um, we're going to provide transportation for those that need it and housing? So um, those are some things that I've been working on that um, I think we need to keep talking about, that planning process for what the demographic shift is going to look like here in Vermont. So um, I think for me, part of the most difficult um, part of representing the whole county mm -hmm. is, um, is the division of economic opportunity between places in this county. And um, one of the ways I'll, um, I will explain that is I, um, if you're in a poorer community, um, it's much harder than it is if you're in uh, and one of the ways I would explain that is around broadband. Um, where we have broadband services, um, we work to improve them there. And then if, but if you're out 
well, if you're at my house, um, <laughs> um, every once in a while I can stand on the, my bed and on the second floor and I can get a tax out. But I can't get a tax out otherwise. And what I'll say to you for opportunity is I'm in the middle of refurbishing the family farmhouse. And last winter, um, I had the opportunity to rent it before the spring to do that. And when they found out there was no broadband, um, I, I couldn't rent the house. And I don't understand why we didn't learn from the 1930s um, when um, they, the country made a commitment to get electricity to everybody in every home across the country. And we worked to do that. And we can't do the same thing now with something like broadband. Um, and I would say you can't, um, I think that's a whole issue here. And I think it plays into some of our demographic problems. Um, young people aren't going to move to an area without some opportunity. And it plays into all of our demographic problems. And our demographic problems here are a crisis. So as you may know, we just passed a paid family leave bill on Thursday and an increase in the minimum wage on Friday. Uh, I, I stood up on the floor talking about uh, the cumulative effect of all this, especially in our rural community. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we paid, uh, passed a uh, paid sick leave bill, uh, now paid family leave bill, increase in minimum wage. Um, there was a representative from Wilmington who said and voted against it. He said, there are two economies. And there are two economies. And I, I try to give the folks, again, as I have in the past, examples of my small stores and restaurants in the area that can't continue to have mandates come down from Montpelier every year. It's, it's number one, hard to, hard to plan for. And number two, the volume of people that come through those doors is a huge difference between Chittenden County. I'll say Chittenden County. Um, <laughs> You know, when, when you have uh, a little little restaurant in Eden um, that uh, New Year's Eve has 27 people come through the door and they still have to have the same, you know, employees on board, uh, that's tough. Uh, when they have to uh, take off an hour off each end of their day uh, to make ends meet, when they have to maybe let somebody go and have a family uh, member come on to make it work. And, you know... Um, you know, I try to explain to people too, that, that little restaurant or those stores, uh, guess what? That's where folks come, there, there is internet there. Um, that's where folks come two, three, four, maybe even every day for one meal locally. There's no other McDonald's down the street or whatever. And so when all these mandates come down, you know, it's not that the employer doesn't want to keep these people on and pay all these additional mandates. It's the, the volume, the economics of it doesn't work. And that's where the two economies come in. My North Troy store, years ago, told me, keep it up, Mark, and I'm going to close my doors. Well, they did. They closed the store in, in North Troy and in Richford. Now, the only store in North Troy now is a Dollar General. And they're the ones that can afford all the mandates that are coming down from Montpelier. So, again, I would say the number one thing is the economics. And it's, and it's huge. It's, it's crossed all... I mean, this Global Warming Solutions Act, if you ask me, is, is going to be instrumental in, in the downfall of, of our rural economy. Uh, broadband is also on, uh, on my list uh, for all of the uh, reasons that, uh, uh, that Rich mentioned, but I, I wanted to mention in particular uh, the role that it plays in um, employment in, uh, in, in both in our committee and elsewhere. Uh, I have heard from employers uh, who uh, have a hard time finding employees in, in part because of uh, the lack of a broadband connection to their employees where they, where they might be living. Um, it's, so it plays a role in employment. Uh, in the economy in allowing uh, certain types of small businesses to, to set up and do business in smaller towns and remoter locations. Uh, it's an important tool in uh, education. Um, 
and in healthcare. I heard a lot from uh, people from various hospitals about uh, the, the ability to use uh, broadband and the internet uh, for certain healthcare services without having to have people um, uh, travel uh, and, and miss appointments. Um, another uh, thing I, I did want to mention was uh, support for uh, our state college system, uh, which uh, as I think most people know is far, far below uh, what it uh, was in terms of percent of the, um, the college budget than it was, uh, let's say, a generation or two generations ago. Um, I know um, that uh, when people, that, that young people uh, have a tendency to remain in the community where they went to uh, college, whether it's the community they grew up in or whether it's the community they came to to go to a particular college. Not, not everyone, obviously, but there is a, there is a correlation. Um, and if we uh, don't find ways to uh, support our uh, college system more than we do now, uh, I think that's just going to continue to go in the wrong direction. I would say I'm going to say one thing because to me it is just kind of above all other things, which is mental health care and specifically substance use disorder. I think looking, and this is speaking to the question I think was specifically to Lamoille Valley and our community, our local community. And looking at our local community through the eyes of someone who's 24 years old, I think it's impossible not to say that's the number one priority. And I think it just speaks to the importance of having as many different perspectives from as many different sectors of the community as possible representing us in Montpelier because whereas anyone who interacts with people of my generation or works in substance use disorder definitely can see this and anyone of any age can be affected by substance use disorder. I think it is specifically an issue that my generation is facing, particularly in, with the opioid epidemic to a degree that, that no generation before us has experienced. Okay, I want to uh, bring attention to the clock because we may lose a legislator or two. Uh, so, uh, yes. Hi, uh, Shane Spence from Johnson. Um, it's been touched on a little bit today, the demographic crisis that we are facing in our state. Uh, and, you know, no offense to anybody looking around the room, we're seeing a little bit of it here. Um, as a young person, this is something that really matters a lot to me. Uh, I think there are a lot of reasons for young people to live in Vermont, but there are a lot of reasons for young people to leave Vermont or to not come to Vermont in the first place. And so my question for all of you is, what are your ideas? Richie's touched on a couple of them, so maybe some new ones from him. Um, what are your ideas to bring more young people to Vermont and to keep young people who live here from moving out once they're done with their schooling? Thanks, Shane. Um, so uh, a couple of things. I think um, uh, I think broadband has been talk touched uh, on a lot. So I think we need to figure that out. I think we did uh, do stuff last year that would allow um, that would allow that um, development and um, expansion of uh, uh, connectivity, um, we can't do it as a state, unfortunately. We've, you know, governor after governor after governor has promised 100% coverage for years by a certain date. It's just not gonna happen. Um, and I don't mean to sound, but what we did last year was to put uh, tools into play, in place for um, municipalities and regions to take, to, to pick up the slack, to understand exactly precisely what they have in terms of assets. Uh, challenges and opportunities, and we have some funding behind it. I know Tasha uh, Wallace with Lamoille County, County Planning Commission, they are working on uh, on, on just that uh, that kind of thing for this area. So broadband, I think, is important. They, frankly, I don't go to places that don't have Wi-Fi anymore. I mean, that's just that's just a, a fact of life for me. So that's that's I think that's important. I think housing. Um, is incredibly important. I was just with a, a young couple um, uh, a couple of nights ago, and um, you know, I and I'm in the housing business, so I know rental business anyway, and in uh, some developments and stuff. And and I will say, I think it's um, what we have as as I, when I was growing up, it was you know you had rungs on a ladder. You had you know you moved out of your parents' home at 18 or 22 or whatever that 
moved out, you moved into a small apartment, you may have moved into a larger apartment with roommates, then you get married, you move into a small house, you get a bigger house because you got a few kids, you know, and then eventually you downsize. You know, it's the, all those rungs on the ladder. Um, a lot of those rungs are now missing. Um, uh, I know people who are in um, um, actual affordable housing units who are no longer subsidized because they're making um, enough money so that they don't have to be, but they cannot move out because there are no uh, no apartments outside of those. So those those uh, apartments that are uh, for uh, those who have low incomes, you know, those those are not available for. Uh, low-income housing because the other people can't move out into a new place. Um, so I think um, I think the Act 250 changes are important with regard to the development of housing. Again, incenting private investment in the development of housing is important. I think well, municipalities need to step up. The water, sewer fees, connection fees, all of that stuff for housing developments are huge, are huge costs, and only serve to uh, Increase the cost, the uh, the cost of rent or the price of a house, um, and uh, and f frankly, a lot of the uh, the other things, stormwater. You know, there's there's just a lot of a lot of investment per unit uh, that you're that you're doing in housing. So I think if we can provide some housing, ensure that people, young people moving in, have an opportunity to buy a house, to raise their family in, uh, that's not a four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar fixer upper. Um, that would be nice. At the risk, I don't want to sound indifferent. I'm just going to go very fast so everybody can have a chance. Uh, I'll, I, I agree with what Heidi said. Um, uh, two things I wanted to touch on, and that's education. We're driving young families at perhaps there's never a good time to be driven into poverty. But when you have little children, it's the worst time because of the development of their brains. And the cost of child care is punishing families and driving them into, into poverty. That needs to change. It's a heavy lift, but we've got to work on that. And then when we do that with high quality child care, those kids will become more resilient. And finally, uh, we were at a different legislative uh, breakfast back in December, mo most of us. And the gentleman there uh, said something that to me was very telling. He said, if you want to change the arc of a person's life, invest in education, and he was talking about higher education in our state colleges. I really, I really believe that. Um, uh, there's much, many, many, many things to answer your question, uh, Shane, but those are two that come to mind on my plate. A small piece that I've been working on is looking at how we enhance our AmeriCorps programs in Vermont as a way to bring young people to Vermont, to have them come here, serve here, and then go to school here, hopefully stay. So to the education, um, so this is uh, some legislation I've been working on that it ended up in the Transportation Committee right now around repairing check engine lights on people's cars at the tech center. So um, trying to create some AmeriCorps programs to bring young people here. So um, <clears throat> I, I'm about to leave here and go to my, um, um, my day <laughs> job, which is, um, I work at the Vermont Student Assistance Corporation. So I'm, I'm gonna give you my three areas of young people. Um, college debt, we've um, seen the average time for payback of college loans go from seven years to 15. So if you're a 23 year old and you're just coming out of college, um, the average first time home buyer in Vermont um, and in our local area, if you talk to our local banks, was to somebody that was 32 years of age in um, 2008. It's now, um, they're near, uh, nearly 39 and a half before they get their first, um, um, able to buy their first home. So we're pushing um, that young generation back further. So college debt, Child care, as Dave said, the average cost of college debt here now is um, um, 14, well, or, or of child care um, per kid is $14,000 a year. So if you're a family with two kids, that's $28,000 a year just for child care for your kids under five. So college debt, child care, and ultimately, I think people are transient to some degree until they buy a home. And I would hope that we could find a way 
not only to create rental property, but what is the pathway for people to get into their home where they can build, begin to um, be tied to a community, a community where they're building assets. And because for most people, their greatest asset is their, the home that they own. And it creates ownership within a community, and we have to do that. So I think college debt, child care, and um, ownership of a home are most important to me. I guess for me, I don't have any one or two specific areas of, uh, of uh, prospects for uh, attracting uh, younger folks of Vermont and keeping them here. Um, I, I'd like to think what I've tried to do over the years is uh, um, slow down the amount of regulation, whether it's in regards to housing, uh, health care, active 50, child care. I mean, I hear that the reason there's not as many child care facilities is because of the older regulations recently. Um, same thing with Act 250. If, if this Act 250 comes out the way a lot of people are hoping it will in regards to um, some of these as aspects, uh, it'll be devastating to, to try to get a, a small business started. Um, housing, same thing. I mean, we're going down the road of, uh, you know, are we going to require contractors to be licensed? Are they going to have to be uh, uh, educated in uh, energy efficiency? And, and is it even going to go as far as saying you, uh, you can't build a new home unless it meets certain uh, residential building standards? Um, um, uh, you know, the list goes on. Um, broadband, we've done a good thing. As, as Heidi said, if you ask me, a lot of towns up my way are looking to, uh, to create a um, uh, broadband um, communications union district. So, you know, there's, there's a positive thing that we're moving forward on, but uh, on the other end of things, the over-regulation of everything is, uh, is, is in my mind, a uh, downfall to especially the young people getting started. Um, I, first of all, I agree with uh, uh, what uh, a lot of people have said before me. I also agree with my own answer to the previous question, which also touched on, 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 on some of these things. I won't uh, repeat all of that, but I, I will note that uh, when that there, there is also a very strong tendency in Vermont and elsewhere for young people, whether they grew up uh, in Vermont or whether they're coming from somewhere else to end up settling um, in the cities and larger towns in Chittenden County, in Burlington, because of the amount of uh, activity, social activity, cultural activity, and all of that, that kind of thing, that to a certain extent, rural areas just, you can't compete with, with that. that will, there will be things that happen in, in uh, uh, in, a, in, in Burlington that are not going to happen in our, in our small towns that may be attractive uh, to younger people. So what we can do is for those people, uh, young people, who uh, are more inclined to live in rural areas is to make it possible for them. And, and I, I can't emphasize enough uh, some of the things that have been said before, uh, including uh, broadband uh, support for uh, the, the state colleges, um, uh, and also transportation sy systems and assistance with uh, getting helping people get into more efficient uh, vehicles and, uh, and electric vehicles now that the market has changed and that's actually becoming uh, more affordable for people. Um. Thanks for the question. I pretty much agree with what's been said already, so I'm going to take the kind of mile high view, which is I think Heidi earlier pretty eloquently made the parallel between consolidation in education and consolidation in healthcare. And I would go a step further and say consolidation in agriculture, consolidation in business. And I think the mile high view here is what are we trying to compete with and how can we compete? We're never going to compete with New York City on opportunity for young people. Like, we just aren't. We can have a single school district and a single healthcare system, and we're still not going to have the education and the healthcare that New York City has. But what we can compete on and what people repeatedly cite, young people repeatedly cite as the reasons why they stay in Vermont or why they return to Vermont if they've moved away is community and, and, the, and the local sense of connection that they have. And so I think with these types of consolidation efforts that are meant to bring more opportunity to rural places, they're still never gonna bring the level of opportunity up to a place that 
can compete, but what they take away from the rural community is the one and only thing we do have over New York City, which is that sense of community. So that's kind of the mile high view of it. Um, I think one other piece I'll just add as a side note is I was recently reading an editorial. I, <laughs> I was recently reading an editorial in VT Digger about um, young people in Windsor or Wyndham County. I believe it was Wyndham County, but I'm not sure. And it was basically making the argument of we should just give up on recruiting people in their early 20s to Vermont because we don't have enough bars and people in their early 20s are never going to go somewhere that doesn't have as good of a nightlife as somewhere else. And it just is so incredibly, to me, it just seems first of all, out of touch, and second of all, just so incredibly condescending to make the statement that the only thing that people in their 20s are thinking about is where they can go to a bar. And I know from my experience with my friends, college debt is really huge, a job is really huge, housing is really huge, everything that was just mentioned is really huge, and to, it just is one of those listen first and then talk about what, what young people need. Um, it's not just bars. Okay, um, we're going to cut off the Q&A period, uh, but we're going to uh, sort of open it up for just general. If you have any questions you'd like to stay, uh, our, we have several legislators here, and let's just say thank you please again for...